If we haven't yet met, I'm Mary Beth Graybill, and I'm the Arlene and Harold Schnitzer Curator of Asian Art here at the museum. <laughs> um, and it really is my great pleasure and honor to introduce today's event. Um, you should all have a copy of the program, and I must begin by uh, expressing thanks on the part of the museum and its audiences to the Agent Art Council for its initial gift and to the daughters of Mildred Snitzer, Dory, Susan, and Jean, and Dory is able to be with us today, for their ongoing support of this lecture series. This is one of only two named lectureships in the Portland Art Museum. Uh, it's now in its 15th year, uh, so longer running than most TV shows, <laughs> and it allows us to bring distinguished scholars of Asian art uh, from really across the world, around the world, to Portland to share with us their recent writing, thinking, scholarship, new perspectives on the field. Today's lecture is one of two events presented in conjunction with a special installation in the Goodman Gallery. That's the gallery of Chinese art that is on your left when you enter the Park Avenue entrance of the museum. Um, 12 works of contemporary Chinese calligraphy and ink painting. These are on loan from a private collector. Uh, this is actually the second of two installations of loans. The first was on view from April till mid-August, and this installation will be with us until the beginning of the new year. So my thanks to that collector, um, and as it turns out, our speaker, Michael Knight, I thank him also for making the introduction to that lecture. I'll say more about Michael in a moment. Um, but first, while you're Minds are still um, alert for uh, announcements. The second event is actually tomorrow morning. Uh, the Asian Art Council and the Docent Education Program are co-sponsoring a dialogue between Michael Knight and Zhang Chongbin, uh, one of the artists who's on view uh, in the exhibition, an internationally renowned uh, Chinese artist who makes his home in the Bay Area. Um, and their conversation, which is open to the public without charge, will take place here in the Whistle Auditorium tomorrow morning at 9.30. Um, and if you're a longtime docent, um, you might be accustomed to coming in through our security doors, but we'll actually have someone at the Hoffman entrance to let you in tomorrow morning. So you're all welcome to come back for that event. Um, so, Michael Knight. Um, Michael Knight is an Oregon native um, and uh, did his undergraduate work at Willamette. Uh, and when I asked him earlier today, what is it that got you into art history? He um, said that it was actually a professor of um, an Arts of the Orient course who said, you have some talent in this field. Uh, and so it's wonderful to think how that sort of encouragement can light a spark under what has become a very distinguished career. And I'm thrilled to also report that he tells me the very first real art museum he visited was the Portland Art Museum. So, um, from Willamette, he went to uh, Columbia, where he received uh, MAs in philosophy and arts, and his PhD. Uh, his dissertation was on probably my favorite moment in Chinese art history, the Chu uh, Kingdom, which uh, was in southern China, central uh, Yangtze, from really about the 9th century to the 3rd century BC. Um, he has moved forward a little bit more recently, as you can tell from today's talk, but his expertise is um, extraordinarily broad in Chinese art, um, painting, calligraphy, furniture, uh, contemporary visual culture. Um, he, as uh, you can see in our pamphlet, he was at the Seattle Art Museum for 15 years where he got to know uh, Bruce Gunther, our chief curator, who was there at the same time. He taught at the University of Washington for four years, uh, and then he moved to the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, from which he retired, took early retirement in January of this year. Um, he curated and wrote catalogs for many exhibitions while there, but the most recent one, which was in in the Asian at San Francisco in fall of 2002 and has just finished a very successful display at the Met in New York, out of character decoding Chinese calligraphy. Um, so we're very, very happy to welcome Michael Knight back to Oregon. Please join me in welcoming him to the podium.
thank you all for coming on such a nice day. I would be out doing my garden. I wouldn't be here. It is great to be back here. Uh, and I must say, Portland has remarkable collections. And I do want to congratulate Mary Beth on having the courage to put up contemporary Chinese ink. Contemporary, uh, that has a lot of uh, difficulty. A lot of people have difficulty with contemporary. Chinese, a lot of people have difficult with difficulty with Chinese. And ink, a lot of people have difficulty with ink. It's almost as difficult as doing Chinese calligraphy. Chinese calligraphy is one that I can say is really, really hard. Though almost 100,000 people visited the calligraphy show at the Met. And it was a great success in San Francisco. So there's hope for everything out there, even the more complicated subjects. So here we have, uh, on the far side over there, that's the installation of the Met show, which they did last year, Ink Art. And of course, these are your own galleries. So you're right up there with the big boys, uh, with the net. Um, I'm going to read a little statement that was actually made in 1985 by the Chinese art critic Li Xiaoshan, who was born in 1957. This was in an essay he titled, My View of Today's Chinese Style Painting. And he gave a very negative picture of ink painting and actually attacked the tradition, saying, under such historical conditions, what today's theory of Chinese painting style needs cannot just be revision and improvement, but must be a fundamental remake. We must abandon old theoretical systems and ossified ideas about art, and must stress the conceptual issues that make a painting modern. Basically, what he was saying is ink painting in China is dead. And that's how that, that actually got translated into the uh, shortened version into English. That was in 1985. In, 19, in 2014, 2013, the Met is doing an exhibition dedicated to ink art. Ink painting has taken off like crazy. The major dealers are all showing ink artists. So what happened in that 30 years in between? Some rel relatively major changes, obviously, within China and within Chinese pers perspective about themselves, the Chinese perspectives about themselves, and then within the, the whole area of Chinese art. One of the things about contemporary art that everybody will tell you, and particularly for me about Chinese contemporary ink art, is it's messy. Uh, it's too close. I can't get a perspective on it. If you ask me, what, are your, what do I think the movements are, where they're going, what's going to happen, I would say, I haven't a clue. Uh, these people are fascinating. They're doing interesting things. The, the, the field is all over. The artists are working all over in different fields. And that's just in that small area of ink. There are great things being done in conceptual art. There are great things being done in oil painting. There are great things being done in all kinds of areas within China. Today, I'm focusing on, on ink. One, that's what I'm most comfortable with. And two, uh, I'm working with this collection so I know the works. So I'm going to narrow it down to ink. And most of the things that you will see on view today belong to the collector that I work with or are things I think he should buy. <laughs> so it's been about 30, 30 some years since the reopening of China. Uh, the Cultural Revolution ended in 1976. China began to really open up to the West, uh, to Western influences and such, in 1980. Things were pretty messy in 1980. If you think about China then, um, the artists who got excited in China about things new, about contemporary art, be it ink or be it anything else, were living in a fascinating environment. Uh, there was no market. You know, this was before Deng Xiaoping's uh, pragmatic socialism or socialism with a Chinese twist came into effect. There was no market in China. Uh, there was no contact with the outside, so there was really no market outside of China. So these people who were playing around and doing these exhibitions and really pushing the margins in, in 1980s were really doing it for themselves. All of them belong to institutions. Uh, there just was no way to be an artist in a private situation in China in the 1980s. You belong to an academy of one sort or another. And those academies were really broken up starting in the early part of the 20th century and right up until today. Those, um, those academies, the way that things were taught and the way you were associated and, and how you were kind of pigeonholed were broken into Xihua, Western art, which would be oil painting, conceptual, whatever, uh, anything that was not Chinese, and Guohua, or national art, which was basically ink, ink on paper. So that dichotomy was set up, and that dichotomy remains in place today. And it's a big part of discussion that goes on in Chinese art. Can you be contemporary and working in ink? 
Do you have to kind of blend the West with the, the Chinese tradition in order to be contem contemporary and work in ink? Well, the whole idea of talking about a fusion is recognizing that there's a dichotomy. So again, it's really messy and really quite wonderful. It's one of those messy periods when interesting and very creative things are going on and just trying to follow what they're doing and who's doing what and why and how things are evolving is fascinating to watch. The nice thing about it and the bad thing about it is the artists are alive. So you can talk with them and they'll tell you one thing and you will disagree entirely with them or you'll say one thing and they'll dis disagree entirely with you. And I find that Zhang Chongbin is on his way up from San Francisco. Uh, he's going to try to make this lecture and he and I argue all the time. So we're gonna have a discussion tomorrow. I don't think we'll argue that much in front of all of you, but do come because he has really fascinating things to say. He's actually living, living this. He's an artist who is going through this transformation right now and going through it in a very, very interesting way. So in order to make this kind of digestible, first to me, and then I hope to you as all as well, I broke my lecture down into, into parts. Uh, I wanted to talk about the tradition. So just to look at where, what people were reacting to or continuing when they talk about the tradition. I want to talk a little bit about the 20th century environment. I want to keep that very, very short. I also want to talk about Chinese ink painting outside of the mainland, really from the middle, middle 20th century until now. Uh, when China uh, went under communist control in 1948-49, well, that was one part of China. And we always, people tend to look at that as China. But there was Taiwan, there was Hong Kong, there was Singapore, and there were Chinese artists living all over the world who continue to do interesting and important things in various media, including ink. So I want to take a very quick, a very, very quick look at that. Then I want to look at uh, mainland painting since 1980. And again, that, that date is a little bit arbitrary, but 1980 is about when things really began to change. And then I want to break that down a little bit further and talk about landscape and its tra that tradition and how it continues, calligraphy, which is another important tradition, and then abstraction, which seems to be a direction that many of these contemporary artists or artists that are looking more in a contemporary vein as a direction people are taking, and we'll talk about that as well. I also want to talk about artistic choices. Many times people look at an artist uh, who's doing something big and bold and abstract and say, well, my kid could do that. Um, and maybe, but their kid isn't doing that. And in fact, a lot of these, all of these artists are very, very well trained in a whole number of areas of art be it oil painting, be it ink painting, be it uh, installation, and they're making choices, and they're making intentional choices about what they're doing. So it's not because they can't do anything else. This is what they're doing because they choose to do it. I think that's an important distinction. It may look like something your kid can do. I don't think so. But uh, it is, th these are choices they're making, and they're making them for reasons, and we want to kind of explore those a little bit. I want to talk about metrics of success. If we have time, we probably won't. But the market has evolved. Um, and those metrics of success are going to be personal success, they're going to be how the critics respond to, the, to your work, how the market responds to your work. Those kinds of things people are just now beginning to talk about uh, in contemporary Chinese art because there hasn't been much to explore. How does the market work? How do these people respond to the market? What other kinds of metric success do they have? Is it, are they looking mainly to be included in major exhibitions? Are they looking to receive critical acclaim? A lot of the critics are the artists themselves, so they talk back and forth. And I can tell you, almost every single artist that we will show up here will have something bad to say about every other artist that we show up here. <laughs> so that's an interesting kind of thing to, to get into a discussion with them about. And then, one thing we also tend to forget when we look at these works and, and things about these artists, we talk about these big kind of conceptual issues and all, but these artists really do love to paint. Uh, and I'll give you just a little bit of a glim glimpse of some of these artists at work. Now, we have time to do all of that. We all have done better than I think we can do, but let's take a look. So the tradition. Many of you are probably familiar with Chinese, the Chinese tradition, uh, ink painting which was associated with the educated elite who were meant to be amateur painting, painters. That is, they did not pr paint as their main profession. They painted as a means of personal expression. As a matter of fact, being a professional artist was really against their whole kind of ethos. They were meant to be am amateurs. So the painting here is Wang Hui, uh, a, a very wonderful painting that happens to be at the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco, one of his great early works. And this kind of sets the tradition. This is the landscape, ink on paper. It's in a hand scroll format, so it follows all of the formats 
um, really the tradition is pretty straightforward and pretty simple. Uh, it's ink. It's paper, it's a several kind of formats, only a limited number of formats. And it's about personal expression uh, within, within those contexts. It's also heavily about, and has always been heavily about tradition, about looking towards the past. Working ink on paper hasn't changed that much. Uh, here's Lou Down, one of the most famous of the contemporary ink painters. Uh, he's still using a brush. He's still working on paper, though he's working on a vertical surface and he's using a drawing. He's not working on a table as most contemporary, uh, con traditional artists would have done. Uh, and they wouldn't probably have used a drawing to start from. He's got a sketch that he works from. You can see it holding in his hand, held in his hand. The major formats, uh, we've already seen a, a hand scroll. We have a hanging scroll on the far side. We have a fan up here. And we have albums which are like little books with individual pages. Most of you are probably familiar with this. If you look at each of these, uh, uh, the hanging scroll is a Wang Jin imitating Zhu Ran's brushwork. Uh, the uh, album is Tang Dai imitating Zhu Ran's brushwork. Well, Zhu Ran was an artist who was active in the 10th century. So even in the 17th century, that was a tradition that had been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. And by the time you get to the 20th century, it's a, a tradition that's been around for a thousand years or more. And doing something new and original in there gets to be a little more difficult than maybe if you were doing something, than if you were Franz Klein or you were a Mark Toby working in ink where it was something entirely new or a Robert Motherwell. So there is that challenge. If you're working in a tradition, and a long, long-standing tradition, to be contemporary, what does that mean? How can you be contemporary? And what does it, how do you have to respond to the tradition to be contemporary? Also, anything that's done outside of these formats then gets to be looking at something, uh, things in a different way. So here we have a work by Zhang Chongbin. I really was hoping he'd be here because he'd have a lot to say about this. Uh, this is a new installation that he's doing. Um, uh, that actually is up now at the Microsoft Center in Beijing. So it's a big installation he has in Beijing. Uh, the piece on the right here is uh, John Duan Jin Wu, who was born in 1970, Beautiful Dream number four, which is Ink on Cardboard is one of his series. And the piece down here is Li Hua Yi, which is a fan-shaped album, Ink on Paper. All of these artists are responding to that long-standing tradition in different ways. Chung Bin is basically still working in ink on paper, but he has stepped away from everything else. The formats, uh, the idea that ink has to be two-dimensional. He actually mixes acrylic with his, with his ink, so he's actually moved away from the medium and is doing things that are entirely different and entirely new. Duan Jin Yu, the artist here, well, that's one of the most traditional of the, of the landscapes. You can see it as a landscape. But he's working in ink on paper on cardboard. So making a statement, I think, about something. There's something going on there. And this is not just a, a, a painting on cardboard. By using cardboard, this artist is saying something. Li Huayi, the artist down here, kind of fascinating. He's doing something that hasn't been a common format since the 12th century. So he is doing artistic explorations, but he's doing his explorations within the tradition. So he's being contemporary in a very neo, um, neo-modernist sense, but he's going back and looking at making his choices and going back through the entire tradition and picking and choosing what he wants to work with and setting up artistic problems and compositional problems, but working within very, very old traditional formats and others as well. We'll see more about him in a while. Then there's John Juan, and he's doing something entirely different indeed. I mean, it has nothing to do with a hand scroll, a hanging scroll album. That's his face. He's an interesting artist. I had fun with him in 1998 when we did the Inside Out exhibition in San Francisco, and we tied him to a log, uh, smeared uh, ground up hot dogs all over him, and turned a bunch of dogs loose on him. <clears throat> no more comment made, need, needed there. They're doing some interesting things, and they have been since, since the 80s and 90s. OK. So um, 1966 to 1976 is something that was, has had a huge impact on Chinese artists uh, within China, certainly, and those outside. This is the time of the, of the Cultural Revolution. So it starts in, in 1966. Um, so Li Huayi was born in 1948. He was, what, 18 when the Cultural Revolution started. 
and he was 28 when the Cultural Revolution ended. Uh, he wasn't allowed to do anything but Soviet socialist-style paintings for that 10-year period. The 10 years between the age of 18 and the age of 28, is, well, those are pretty fundamental years in any, any artist's life. Um, so he has a very interesting kind of idea, perspective about Western art. Anything that looks like this, he doesn't like. He doesn't want to have anything to do with it. He actually abhors it. So one of the reasons driving his direction and explorations that he's making is the, the experience that he had during the Cultural Revolution. Zheng Chongbin, who was born in 1961, he was five years old when the Cultural Revolution started, uh, and he was 15 when it ended. Those are also kind of pivotal years in, in, uh, in an artist, any person's life. But he has fascinating stories to tell about what it was like being a child in the Cultural Revolution. So if you're around tomorrow, well, that's a question you may want to ask him, because it was a different time. Uh, not what you would expect at all, and I'm not going to say much more about that. But this is what was going on for that 10-year period, and actually for the period, quite a bit of a period before, but really from 66 to 76, this is all you could do. The only patron of the art was the state. The only kind of art you could do was, was something that had to do with the state, what the state wanted. So there was a big break. It was as if everything else had been just kind of wiped off the map and you had to start all over again. Anybody painting in ink did it in secret and at real risk. So the whole kind of the tradition, there was a break and an opportunity then to reinvent the tradition and reinvent everything else as it went on from that, that point on. So the Cultural Revolution, that's a very, very big break, if I were to say so. Okay, I'm already halfway through my time allotted and I'm only just getting warmed up. So artists outside of, out of the mainland. We shouldn't forget about these, these artists. Artists like Zhang Daqian, who uh, obviously was active at the very end of, the very beginning of the 20th century up until the 19, 1980s, was doing really wonderful things. He, was, he left China in 1949. He was in Carmel. He was in San Francisco. Uh, he was in Switzerland. He studied the contemporary art scene, and he adapted to it. He changed his styles. He made things that were fascinating and interesting and wonderful, and he was doing the these big, bold, almost abstract kind of landscapes like this um, during the 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And as he got into the 70s, really, uh, he got very serious about this. These were big, kind of splashed ink, poor moral landscapes that really approach abstraction. For those of you who are looking to collect Chinese painting, this is something you should try to collect. Because something like that would probably cost you no less than $12 million. So you could probably get two or three. Cici Wong uh, is better known, perhaps, as a dealer, but was also in New York. Uh, so he moved from China also in 1949, and he moved to New York. And he was very involved with what was going on and very aware of what was going on in the New York schools, uh, the art schools there. So he also looked at, what can I do? What can I add? What, what can make Chinese ink? something he loved, had a passion about, and was con completely c conversant in, what can I do that would make it contemporary? So he also was exploring uh, ink, and with an idea of looking at the West. Le Guasson, uh, he traveled up and down the West Coast. I don't know if he came to Portland in the 19, late 1960s and, and the 1970s. And which is the Witches Earth series, which he started in the late 60s? Anybody want to guess what that was based on? The moon, the moon landing, that's right. So he was very conversant with contemporary events. Um, he was using subject matter that came out of the newspapers of his time. He was interested in this, which is Earth, this kind of, you know, would bend to another body, of, and then the solar body, whatever. Uh, we've been off the Earth, and here, which is Earth, which is, so he got into this kind of conceptual stuff. He also played around with the formats and with the media. He used uh, crumpled up newspaper. He messed around with it. He wasn't just using brush. Uh, he pushed his landscapes right to the point of abstraction, though he never actually stepped, right, stepped all the way over. This is getting close. But, but it's still a landscape. I think you can still see it as, as a, a landscape form. Things that he was doing in the 1980s. Liu Guangzong is still active today. He had a big installation at the Hong Kong Art Basel this year. He's still doing marvelous things. So being an artist, I think, uh, born 1932, he's been at it for a long, long time. Maybe being an artist is a good thing. You'll live a long time. Wang Fangyu also left China, uh, moved to New York. 
his area of exploration was calligraphy, and uh, he did wonderful things with calligraphy. Uh, the exhibitions, there have been a number of exhibitions on his, his art, his calligraphy, and they're called Dancing Ink. So he was actually interested in music and in dance and in ink. I got to serve as his research assistant when I was at Columbia. It was a great pleasure. He was a marvelous guy. He was one of the great specialists in seals and reading Chinese seals, that very, very ancient script that shows up as seals on, on, uh, on paintings. So I got to study seal script with him. He was a fascinating and wonderful and interesting guy and a computer specialist. Uh, his main claim to fame was he was working with Princeton at that time, trying to develop a software program that would translate Chinese. He never succeeded. It's happened now, but he didn't at that time. A fascinating individual. Tung Yangsu, Grace Tong, um, she moved to Taiwan. I heard one of her pieces, two of her pieces are up out there now, and she's not a very small, not a very big person. She's a rather small person. She does these huge calligraphic pieces that are really wild and expressive and really pushing the edges, I mean, really pushing the edges of those traditions, though she uses very old and very traditional statements. So to be like lofty mountains and mountain streams, well, that's about the kind of educated elite, the scholar. Attempting greatness is not enough to make one great. <coughs> I think it's a lesson for all of us, maybe. Lu Xiuquan. Uh, Lu Xiuquan is Hong Kong based and uh, self taught, but uh, very influential. And he was doing, again, pushing into abstraction. There's still a little bit of a sense of a landscape there, but he was looking at uh, Zen painting, Chan painting in Chinese, looking at what's going on in Japan. He was bringing things in from the West. Uh, he was mixing things up and making some fascinating kind of explorations when he died rather young and rather suddenly in 1975. He was really just getting going on some really wonderful explorations. These paintings that he did ranged in the scale from this one, which is about maybe four feet tall, to one that somebody bought for me when I was still at the Asian Art Museum, which was over eight feet tall. They're marvelous. Wu Shis Wong uh, again left and went to Hong Kong and then to New York, and he was working in ink, but he was also doing computer it computer-generated graphics. He was mixing things up, mixing up the media, and working very interesting on the edge of conceptual and what was going on with ink and with different kinds of really contemporary media being kind of the computer-generated images. Irene Zhou, 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 Zhou Lu Yuan. Um, studied with Lu Xiuquan, and you can, I think you can see that and what's going on there. Uh, in the 19, late 70s, she had a stroke and started doing things like this. I don't think she was doing drugs. I think she was really doing, pushing the edges of, exploring the edges of abstraction and also of color. She really did push the element, edges. You have two pieces by her on view upstairs right now. Uh, this one, House of Santa Claus. I picked that because House of Santa Claus, I have no idea what this has to do with the House of Santa Claus, but there it is. Uh, and then the other one that's up there as well is in, in a vertical format. So one horizontal, one vertical. She really did powerful explorations of abstraction. Mainland China since 1980. So what, 1980, what begins to happen in 1980s? No information from the West. Uh, artists, uh, art teachers, uh, different people began to visit China. And again, that was influential on any number of the artists that we're seeing here. If you're to talk to Chongbin tomorrow, I hope he, he will be able to answer your questions. A number of people came. Interesting enough, a lot of them coming from San Francisco and were very influential in the art area around, art environment around Shanghai. So they had a big um, impact on Li Huayi, on Zhang Chongbin, and a number of others. Li Huayi moved to San Francisco in 1982. Zhang Chongbin did so in 1989. So San Francisco became a point of entree for those artists uh, who were influenced by things that were coming, people that were coming from the West to China. Chinese artists were allowed to travel. They had new abilities to travel, and they were also being underwritten by the academies for which they were working, so they were able to go to the West. On the other hand, there was no market in China. And they were all carrying some baggage coming out of the Cultural Revolution, but there was really no market. And those who went to the West first entered the, the system in the West uh, by working at various institutions, universities, or whatever. But when they stayed on, they had to take on that whole market-based economy, the whole market-based 
art world in the West. They had to adapt to that. And that was something for an artist like Li Huayi, who was already in his 30s, rather difficult to do. So that was a whole adaptation that they had to take on, and how to respond to, how to react to, and what to do with a market economy. When this person says, I want you to do this work, I want it to, to fit behind my sofa here in this living room. Uh, and that's not what he wanted to do. Well, that didn't have anything to do with that then. So those kinds of things, that kind of market, uh, is very important. So this, these were changes that were going on in the 80s. There were also a lot of these groups that grew up, basically artists talking to themselves, uh, setting on ex exhibitions, exhibitions that would open, the government would take a look and close them down, exhibitions that were pushing the boundaries in every possible way. So the 80s, in my mind, are one of the most fascinating decades uh, in Chinese art for a long, long time. And again, your reaction to these whole changes in the 1980s depended on who you came from. Wu Gan Zhong, who was born in 1919, uh, was traditionally educated, had traveled to Europe in the late 1940s, uh, returned to China in 1950, was sent to the countryside in 1966 to do uh, good educational labor, where he said life was only planting rice, carrying coal, criticizing one another, and fighting one another. The only thing one, no one was allowed to do was paint. Uh, so when he came out, and when it came, it came to an end, 1976, he had a lot of things stored up and was ready to do anything. But he'd been thinking. And he wrote a series of important essays in 1979 and 1980 in which he attacked the heavy emphasis of socialist art on content over form and declared that abstract beauty is at the core of artistic creation. So uh, this piece is in the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco and it's a view of the humble, roof of the humble administrator's garden in Suzhou, one of those famous gardens. Uh, this was done in the 1980s. Actually, we had a pretty good idea of when it was done because the Asian Art Museum has the sketch that he did for it and also the painting. It's kind of a nice combination. This little piece here is at this current, uh, the September, actually the auction is happening this week at Sotheby's, another piece done in the 1980s, and you can see he's moving into abstraction. So he's looking at moving away from landscape, experimenting around, but having come from a long tradition and also having studied in Europe in the 50s, a very different perspective than an artist who was younger and had a very different experience in, during the Cultural Revolution. Gu Wen Da, who was born in 1955. So he was in his early teens uh, as we got into the Cultural Revolution and, and uh, 21, when it ended. He was one of the most influential and most thoughtful of the conceptual artists during the 1980s and was doing all kinds of wonderful things. He kind of represents a group of ink painters for whom the issue um, about ink was not how to westernize it, but rather how to make it contemporary and global. So he was trying to bring global issues to bear on ink. On, he wasn't denying that he was Chinese. He was trying, not trying to move away from being Chinese. He was taking the Chinese tradition and trying to make it global. He wasn't trying to make it Western. He was trying to make it global. And there's a difference. In those terms, contemporary, Western, Chinese, they're all really loaded when you get into this kind of a sphere. But Gu and Da really worked at looking at, OK, how do I take my tradition, who I am, what I do, and make it global, make it relevant on a global stage. So his experimentation, starting in the 1980s, uh, and it's marvelous. This piece is obviously impossible to show here because although it looks like a hand scroll, it's 24 inches high, and it's 198 inches long. What is that? It's very, very big. It's huge. So he was doing big, interesting things and pushing the edges of what was landscape. Um, even in the 1980s. And by now, in 2011, when this piece was, which has just come down, was done, he's combining landscape, he's abstracting landscape, he's mixing characters in, he's mixing characters that are not real characters, they're made up characters. He's really pushing the element, he's looking at conceptual things, working with a number of artistic issues, and kind of pushing the boundaries in all different kinds of ways, exploring how to make ink art relevant on, a, on an international conceptual sense. Not being Western, being Chinese. Li Huayi represents a very different kind of approach to this. Um, as I said earlier, he was born in 1948, so during the Cultural Revolution, as most of the later part of his teens and into his 20s. Whoops. 
So when he left uh, China, he was born in Shanghai, uh, a wealthy family. He suffered during the Cultural Revolution, had trained both in ink uh, with the major ink artists of his time, but also trained in Western uh, painting and in sculpture and everything else. Um, and then for that 10-year period, all he could do, he was handed posters like the ones that we saw earlier, and said, here, paint this on that wall over there. And that's all he could do. He came out of the Cultural Revolution with a really negative attitude about that kind of art. So when he came to San Francisco in 1982, he started doing things like this, uh, mixing abstraction uh, and calligraphy, mixing kind of old and new. He was looking at patterns, border patterns on ancient Chinese arts, but he's also looking at abstraction. As time passed, he began to move away from abstraction and moved into landscape. And then Li Huayi began to set himself up a series of very interesting artistic problems. Um, he was being very postmodernist. Uh, he was looking at making his choices. He was looking at things like this. Well, what are the artistic issues going on here? This is your first chance to say something if you want to. <laughs> If you're painting on something as big as this, and look at it, it's 150 inches wide and it's one of two. It's huge. Your compositional issues are very different than if you're painting on something like that, right? That's about this big around. So hand scrolls, hand albums, hanging scrolls, big screens like this, they all present a whole series of compositional and artistic issues that Li Huayi is now exploring. He's looking at these and saying, these are issues I want to explore. These are artistic issues I want to explore. They're not about tradition. They're about my personal exploration. He's not worried about being Western. He's not worried about being traditional. He's worried about issues, artistic issues that he's exploring and pushing, pushing the elements, pushing the, the limits. He's looking, he's making his choices and making his points of departure, not by looking into things in the West or looking at things elsewhere. He's looking into his past or China's past. Things like that. If you didn't know that was Li Huayi, you'd think that was a Southern Song album, fan-shaped album, so something done in the 12th or 13th century. Really, if you were to look at it, you would really think that. He's aged a paper, he's done everything. So he's messing around with the format, he's messing around with the tradition. Something like this, he spent years trying to do, get a, something that would work on a gold surface. Uh, John Da Qian did some really fascinating pieces on gold, and Li Wei saw that, thought that was interesting. He was looking at John Da Qian, not Mariyama Okyo, as we were talking about, Mary Beth and I were talking about earlier, not Japanese art, but about John Da Qian. He wanted to figure out how do you do things on gold? What happens when you start doing, working with ink on gold? He ended up doing with gold colored silk or with gold sized silk rather than paper because he found that more successful. I would go to his home, which was then in San Francisco, now he's mainly in, in Beijing, and he would be angry and frustrated and rumpling up and throwing away these works that would just kill me. I just wanted them so bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another series of explorations that he is doing now, um, anybody want to take a guess what's going on here? Okay, what are the big dichotomies in China? In and yang, right? Everybody knows in and yang. That's one of the things. China, Chinese philosophy, Chinese cultural systems are really set up on dichotomies. And Li Wei is, exp is now exploring dichotomies. And the expl explorations that he's doing are hard, rock, soft, water. These are two different s parallel series that he's doing right now. These may be traditional in format, they may be traditional in me media, but no Chinese artist has ever done anything like this before. You've got rocks dissolving into mist, rocks dissolving into water. You've got rocks that are as hard and crystalline as anything that you'll ever want to see. His brush strokes, his manner of creation, here, very short, static, regular strokes make things look very, very hard. It's every aspect of the painting is responding to an exploration that he's doing. He's exploring the contrast between hard and soft, between rock and water. So he's setting up artistic issues, and his whole life now is about setting up, his artistic life is about setting up these series of artistic issues and pushing them, taking them all the way to a particular point. So he's satisfied he's done that exploration, then he goes off on another one. Liu Dan uh, is also of that same generation and is looking at um, tradition in a very different way. Liu Dan is, a, is one of those prodigies 
There are drawings done by him when he was 13 that are copies of Renaissance, Renaissance works on paper. And you would swear that he was Italian and he was living in the 1500s, 14-1500s. He is an artist who can do sketch anything he wants to, to a point of, that you can't miss. I mean, you just swear that it's an exact copy. This is a rock. Um, I know the rock. The rock lives with the same collector who had the, the collector. And you put that rock in front of that painting, and that's the rock. It's right there, even though it's done in ink. And then he had these marvelous uh, calligraphies that go with. Lucien. OK, I put these up here because I love them. They're a little bit outside of the range of what I'm talking about. Mushin is an artist who was born in the, in the late 1920s, 1927. Uh, he was well-educated. He was very aware of Western art and uh, philosophical ideals. Um, he suffered tremendously during the Cultural Revolution. He was arrested in 1966 and stayed in an underground prison for more than 18 months. Uh, he has a series that, uh, called the Prison Notes, things that he managed to secret paper and write things about them. So he writes about his, his experiences. He mixes gouache with ink. Um, he doesn't really care if he's contemporary or not. He's doing things that are about his own personal experience and personal expression. And they are marvelous and moving. And knowing his life story, uh, they're more marvelous and moving. Uh, I, I just happen to love them. So I have two pairs of them up here. Yang Enping, an artist who was born in 1934, who now lives uh, in upstate New York, or last that I knew was up in state New York. She joined the Central Academy of Fine Arts in 1966. Anybody get that? She joined the Central Academy of Fine Arts in 1966. She was at the Central Academy of Fine Arts at the beginning of the Cultural Revolution. And she was still working within the Chinese system in 1975 when she was at the National Museum. So she managed somehow to live through that period in a government-supported, and an important government-supported um, position. She left China in 1986 to go to New York, uh, where she is now. And she does these just gorgeous explorations of, the, uh, of Lotus. Mary Beth, I promised I'd get done in soon, so I'll keep going. It's another, another artist, uh, Peng Wei who, uh, born in 1974, so she was really only two when the Cultural Revolution came to an end. And um, so she didn't have the same kind of experience. Basically, the Cultural Revolution is not part of her life experience. So she's part of that generation that's really coming onto the scene now, artists who really did not live through the Cultural Revolution and have no memories of it, and have started pretty much with a clean slate. They don't need to do the, they need to be dealing with that whole issue. She does these marvelous paintings. Uh, she does these rocks, these scholars' rocks, which so many artists are doing. But she also does these long and interesting hand scrolls. And this is the painting. She paints everything. She paints the covers. She paints the, the colophones on the front. She paints the colophones on the back. And she paints the landscape. And the landscapes are marvelous. You'd swear, I mean, she must have been an, a, a student of the late Ming artist Cho Ying, or middle Ming artist Cho Ying, because they are done very much in his style. And very much, she has perhaps the best brush control in, the, in that sense of traditional brush control of any of the artists around that I know. She really has great control of her brush. But she changes all the main characters here to women. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So calligraphy. If landscape painting has a long tradition, calligraphy has an even longer one. Uh, it was the first art practiced by the educated elite um, nearly 2,000 years ago, uh, during the, the beginnings of the, of the Han Dynasty. At that time, it was an art that people, that artists were known, uh, that the emperors collected, that the beginnings of the educated elite, as they began to establish their artistic traditions, they were practicing it. So calligraphy as an art form was the art form in China for a long time, and has been. Exploring calligraphy is a very loaded and wonderful thing to do. So decoding Chinese calligraphy has been part of my life for quite a long time. I love it. 
1998, I was at the Asian Art Museum, and we took the exhibition Inside Out, New Chinese Art, uh, which was organized by SF MoMA and by the Asia Society in New York. And this work by Chu Jiujie uh, was there. He was a very, he was a younger artist then, just in his late, uh, late 20s, early 30s. Writing the Orchid Pavilion preface 1,000 times, uh, which took him between 1990 and 1995. And the piece that we had, of course, was this, and then the video of him doing a thousand times. The Orchid Pavilion is a famous work by Wang Shijir, who was active in the, in the fourth century. And it was a piece that just became kind of the, for a particular kind of writing, for semi-cursive script, was kind of the piece that everybody studied. And really, in your career, you did the thousand character essay, and you did this preface at least a thousand times before you became anywhere near a point where you could start to explore, play around. So he did it, but he just did it on one piece of paper. That piece of paper was gorgeous, and the concept was just amazing. I just loved it. But it does show that kind of overwhelming weight of tradition. Um, Everybody does this. Everybody does this. If you're a member of the educated elite, whether you consider yourself or an artist or not, if you were living in China before the end of, of the Qing dynasty, this is what you did. You did the Orchid Pavilion at least a thousand times so that you could pass your imperial exams. You were judged at the imperial examinations on how you did, how, well, how good your calligraphy was. So this was part of that tradition and that overwhelming burden of, tradi of, of that tradition. It's also just gorgeous. And the conceptual thing, I just love it. <clears throat> Xu Bing, book from the sky, installed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This is their installation from uh, this last year. I got to work with Xu Bing. I got to, I actually had some money from the Robert uh, H.N. Ho Foundation in Hong Kong to commission a video piece from Xu Bing. He's brilliant. He's an amazing conceptual artist. I mean, he's just way, way, way out there. So he did this 18-minute video, which he and a group of people that he worked with did 10,000 actual hand drawings for and then put them into a video format. And it's about calligraphy and about that tradition and about its impact, calligraphy's impact on Chinese society, not Chinese society impact on calligraphy, but calligraphy's impact on Chinese society and so on. It is a marvelous thing. But what he became famous for first, this actually got him one of those MacArthur uh, genius grants, was Book from the Sky. Uh, and that's been around since 1996, I believe, or before then, 1990s. And this is how it was installed at the, at the Met. For those of us coming at it from a, a Western perspective, it's a gorgeous installation. It's an installation piece that's just gorgeous to look at. It's this wonderful paper, and it's, it's endless. It's just gorgeous. It's printed. Uh, those pieces are printed, and, and this is a wood block that is, he carved these wood blocks uh, when he was at the Central Academy, he carved them. Uh, this is a page printed from, the, from them, and these two are in the collection. Uh, and this is an x-ray taken of one of, the, of one of those pages, one of those books. But not only did he carve the wood blocks, but there's not one real Chinese character in all of those blocks. Those are all made up. And we installed it in San Francisco. The Chinese audience, of course, would, they would read that, and then they would go through and try to find one real character. And they spent days. I can see them there. So look, there's got to be a real character. There are none. Uh, Xu Bing's thing is language. So calligraphy and language, I mean, his thing is language. And, and if you know his more recent works, he has been doing language, all kinds of language-related things, related things. He has a whole language, and he has a whole book written in a language that's made up from signs, bathroom signs and subway signs and different kinds of signs. It's a whole book. You can read it. Anybody can read it. It's international language, the language of signs. Um, he also does things where there are mountains. Uh, so again, this is a print, but made up of characters. Landscripts. How many of you can read a little bit of Chinese, can recognize characters? OK. So what's that character right there? You see it? This Here it is, this character right here. It's the character for Stone. So he makes his landscape paintings. They're actually made up of the characters for the objects that are within them. So the stones are all the character for stones. And the tree, if you look hard enough, there's a character for tree, and so on. Uh, there's a collector in the Bay Area. This is not a huge one, but there's one in the Bay Area that is huge. It's almost as big as this screen. And it's all characters making up this marvelous landscape. So again, wonderful conceptual things. But then he signs his name, Xu Bing. That's actually X-U-B-I-N-G. So again, this is his English, you know, his English-Chinese mix. Oh dear, 
I know it's going to happen. Um, here's Lou Don again, um, and he's also writing about language and the concepts of language. You don't get a sense of how big this thing is, but this is the artist and Jane Debevoy, one of the, the big pe people, wonderful people in the field, and that's the work. Uh, this is in the Collectors in New York, New York home. What he's done is taken a tiny little dictionary that's about this big, and blown it up to where it's about, well, that's about life size right there. Um, so he's talking about a dictionary, he's talking about a favorite object, he's talking about taking small and making it big. He's also talking about the changeover from standard script to the, from the old way Giles, the old system of writing to the simplified characters, old characters to new characters. He's talking about all kinds of things. So this is a very complicated, it's marvelous, it's gorgeous to look at, it's something you can just sit and, and, and spend hours looking at. And you can also read the, the entries, he's actually made them so you can read them. Um, but it's also a conceptual piece that has a lot of baggage that goes with, so it's interesting to look at and think about it and to talk with him about that in that sense. Wang Dongling uh, was born in 1945 and now lives in Hangzhou, uh, the Silicon Valley of China, and uh, is one of is a, a classical uh, calligraphy calligraphy ex expert. But he's taken calligraphy. Here he's writing uh, Zhuangzi, who's one of the warring states, uh, kind of fourth to third century BCE, one of the great uh, kind of pre-Daoist philosophers in China, and taken one of his sayings and done it in traditional calligraphy. And here he's exploring, it's almost as if he's taken a single character and blown into a detail where it no longer reads as a character. He's just talking about the expressive power of the brush vis-a-vis -vis calligraphy. Foaming Chip, this piece is up right now. I encourage you to go up and look at it. He's taking the Heart Sutra, which is one of his favorite subjects, and he's doing it in light script and in dark script. So this is both the same content, just done in, in the reverse. Gu and Da, not only does he work in landscape, but was also a trained calligrapher and quite a marvelous calligrapher. Um, and here he is doing calligraphy, and here he is messing with calligraphy and putting it into a landscape. He's also done made-up characters, and he's done characters in huge scale made out of human hair that he's collected in barbershops around the world. Um, he's done all kinds of interesting things, again, dealing with language, with calligraphy, and with language and the issues that go with. I'm going to hurry a little bit. I'm sorry. I want to get to abstraction. <clears throat> because here's an issue that I find fascinating and also difficult. Uh, it's one where it seems from the Western perspective that a Chinese artist can only be contemporary if he starts to explore things in, in he or she starts to explore things in abstraction. Uh, some people would say that abstraction never existed in Chinese art. Well, I would say here's a Song Dynasty, a Northern Song pot, which is abstract and done with brush on a brush on a brush surface. So abstraction certainly existed in Chinese art. This is another piece you can buy if you want. They estimate 2.5 to 3 million. Again, a cheap piece. Um, it's true, abstraction did not exist in the arts of the educated elite. Calligraphy was always words, and landscapes were always landscapes. They never actually broke away from that. The reasons why? I think they could do enough of the personal expressions, the kind of things that an abstract artist would be doing, and the reasons that they would be doing it. They could find it within the works that they were doing. They did not need to break those traditions. The concept didn't mean anything to them. It didn't. It wasn't needed. It wasn't necessary. Um, if you were doing crazy, wild, Kuang Zhao uh, uh, cursive calligraphy, you were expressing yourself through brush and ink and your dynamics. Same in the landscape. So abstraction probably wasn't necessary. Regardless, they didn't cross that boundary. That was something that really didn't start happening happened in those working outside of China in the 1950s and 60s, happened within those working in the mainland and then moving to the United States after 1980. Uh, here are two of them coming at it from pushing those elements, pushing the boundaries, Gu Wenda and uh, Wu Guangzhou, both uh, working, moving towards abstraction from the landscape point of view. Taishang Zhou, one of these younger generation, born in 1968, younger generation artist who is known for actually working in Northern Song styles, very much in Northern Song styles. And in fact, the elements here are Northern Song styles, but Taishang Zhou seems to be moving towards abstraction. He's taking the elements, 
Uh, and turning them into energy almost feels like raw energy. It's no longer possible really to read a landscape here, and he's not trying to create a landscape here. He's taking the landscape elements and that sense of chi, that sense of power, that sense of energy, and expressing it in a large, get large format uh, in those traditional forms, in those forms, in the brush strokes, but no longer as a recognizable landscape form. So that's one direction towards, towards taking the tradition, the landscape tradition, and blowing it apart and doing something different with it. That's one direction. Wang Dongling, as we've seen, takes a, basically what he's done is taken a character and just made it big. You know, he's blowing it up huge. So he's talking about that, you know, that whole thing about abstraction, about the expressive power and, and self-expression, but he's doing it now, taking it out of the, the context of being a character and putting it into being an abstraction. Qin Feng, uh, this piece is up. Qin Feng does some of the same things. He starts from calligraphy and goes into the powerful abstract expression of brush and ink on paper. Wang Chuan does some of the same things, though he's moving a little slightly different direction and has a different background. This wonderful thing about this collection and about things that you've been able to see is that there are artists that are very, very important in China, like Wang Chuan, who are basically unknown in the West, remain basically unknown in the West. They got, they're better known because they were shown in the Met Show, but Wang Chuan is one of those who was extremely influential and very, very important in China, but didn't spend much time in the United States, so has had little marketing. Uh, it's not being sold by Sotheby's and Christie's and Michael Goodhouse. Madashan, he comes in abstraction from a different direction, and a direction I think that most people haven't really explored, because Madashan comes at abstraction from the figure painting perspective. So if you look at these as a series, uh, he loves to paint women, and that's what he's doing. But if you move through these, you know, you go from a, a recognizable human form to something that's approaching abstraction. Interestingly enough, that's the direction that Zhang Chongbin comes from, uh, comes at this from. And he's one of the most successful, perhaps I would say, the most successful artists and really moving into abstraction. And he came at it, he was trained as a figure painter. He was actually trained as a figure painter working in fine line painting. Uh, and he took that, that, those figures, began to look at them as forms, began to explore those forms. And that exp exploration then moves into the Blot series, which has just come down. And then now he's moved beyond that. And Chong Bin really plays with, I, I love his works. I guess you can tell that. Um, he mixes his ink with acrylic. So ink painting, ink on paper by definition is two-dimensional because the ink is absorbed into the paper. His isn't. His paper has a surface. It's three-dimensional. And then he breaks the forms. He's no longer doing hand scrolls and hanging scrolls and albums and such. He messes around with the forms. He messes around with the surfaces. He really is doing interesting things in pure abstraction. He's really moved, gone from form, figure painting to form, to explorations of the concepts of surface and design and shape and so on. So an interesting artist continuing to work in ink, but moving well beyond that tradition. Okay, I'm gonna skip. The rest of this, I want to do a little bit of artistic choices just because those are interesting. This is Chung Bin. This is what he was trained at. And this is what he taught at the Hangzhou Academy until he left China. So this is something he was doing up until 1988, fine line painting like this. He also did sketches and drawings like this. This is a major installa installation piece that he did at the uh, Marina, Sa Marina Bay Sands, a big, big casino in Singapore. Uh, you laugh, but this was, there were artistic competitions, and he was amongst the world, international big name artists who were chosen to do this. And that's his, his piece was these enormous clay pots. They're that tall, and done at Yixing, and then shaped and installed in the space. So conceptually, design-wise, he works in a very different kinds of, different kinds of areas. This is what he's doing now. Uh, this kind of thing is turbulence and these kinds of things. This is, these are works that he's doing at the Microsoft Center in Beijing that are up right now. Li uh, Huayi, you know, he can do anything. In his house, Li Huayi has this painting that you swear was a Renaissance painting. Uh, he did it. He went to Italy, he loved what he saw, he painted it, he copied it, so he has it hanging in his house. He does cowboys, uh, he did paintings from Dunhuang, uh, he did abstraction for a while, and now he does this. 
Let's skip over this, except to show you this is the, two, the pair of paintings by Li Huayi to give you a sense of the scale. Those of you who are familiar with uh, the Chinese art world, that's Mi Si Long's husband, that's uh, James Lally. Uh, this is at Eskenazi's opening at, at uh, uh, the Ukrainian Institute back in 2009. The market really has moved to China. Uh, this is Ink Studio, uh, these big galleries permanent spaces in China for contemporary art. No Western art dealer could do this. So the market now that uh, Deng Xiaoping's uh, socialism with a Chinese twist has really taken off and the market is big. Uh, the market in China is huge. One thing we do tend to overlook in all of these conversations uh, and things that I've, I've tended to overlook as I get into the philosophy and, and the market and da 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 da, these guys love to paint. The actual act of painting is something they enjoy to do. You talk to Li Huayi about painting, he says, yeah, I go to paint, then I forget all that other stuff, and I just paint, and I love it, it's great. I've got these things that I set up, these things I want to do, and I just love to paint. Liu Dan, the same way. Uh, the actual physical act of painting is something that they really enjoy. They're very different in their approach, uh, approaches, they're very different in how they feel about it, but they do love the art of painting. You can see that when you watch somebody like Sun Xiaojin uh, doing some of his big tree forms. He's just wild and crazy and having fun, he was loving. And he's looking at an actual root or an actual tree, but he's doing these things and he's obviously into it. And you could yell at him and he wouldn't hear you. <laughs> Li Huayi, uh, Li Huayi has classical music turned up, classical Western music, turned up so high you can scarcely stand in the room with him, and then he does this kind of thing. He really closes out the outside world. Uh, he has music going, and then he does, if you look, that is a tiny little brush. He does these huge, huge landscapes with this tiny little brush, and it can take him months and months and months of constant work to finish a one work. Um, he doesn't make very many paintings, but they're marvelous, and he loves to paint. I ask him, is there a problem for you to decide when they're done? And he says, no. There comes a point when I know one more stroke is going to ruin it, and it's done. But he does love the act of painting. Wenda, Gu Wenda, he loves to paint. He also loves to work in front of an audience. Uh, but he loves it. I mean, he is a great technician. Look at these. I mean, look at him. He's got this huge brush. When we had him in San Francisco again in 1998, he did an ink marriage. He actually did this dance with this, this woman who was at the museum's staff, and they did this dance, and they did a marriage, and they did ink, and it was Western and Chinese and ink and, and Western traditions and dance, and he's a showman. He's a marvelous... Uh, Anyway, there we go. And there's, there's Chong Bin in his studio, which is in one of those self-storage units uh, in San Rafael. I go up there and drink his marvelous tea and uh, argue with him about art on a regular basis. His is perhaps the most physically demanding of the artwork forms. He's on his, bending his back and running across this paper, using different kinds of brushes and doing marvelous things. I went over a little bit, Mary Beth, I'm sorry, but not too bad. So if we have questions, please, I'd be glad to try to answer them. Yes? Um, the artist that you said was a bit of an outlier, I think it was Wu Lin or something like that, who had the works, who spent the 18 months in prison. Oh, uh, uh, Mu Xin, uh-huh. Okay, sorry. That's quite all right. But um, that was the only one you mentioned that I heard who paints out of what I would call a psychological place when you said something like his, his experiences and his responses to the Cultural Revolution and being in prison, and I read upstairs that his work was all destroyed at one point. Can you, um, is that just because that's the only one I heard, the only one you mentioned, or is it um, also an outlier that, that, he, that someone does more interior, you know, strictly psychological work? Um, th that's a, a question that I didn't, I, oh, I brought it up with him and I perhaps shouldn't have, but I, I'm glad I did and I'm glad you asked the question. Each one of these artists has their own story and their own way of, of responding. So when I mentioned Pang Wei, uh, the woman artist, uh, and so she's doing wonderful, marvelous landscapes, and she's painting you know, the, the borders and everything and doing, but all of the characters are, China, are women. 
That's a statement. That's a personal statement. That's a personal statement about China and a male-dominated culture. She's making a very strong personal statement there. It may, there are wonderful things to look at, and they, it may be a message that's a little subtle. But if you do the, the uh, poem of the Red Cliff, the great Sudan Paul poem of Red Cliff, if you do that subject and put women in the boat, you're making a statement. Uh, that's a psychological, that's a personal, and a very powerful personal statement. You're taking one of the great, great subject matters of Chinese literature and Chinese painting and, and making it into a woman-based rather than a man-based theme. That's something. Li do you see any people in that landscape? Could you live in that landscape? He's making statements about, about the world that he lived in, his feeling about the world that he lived in, but also what man is doing to the world that we're living in. So those kinds of subtexts, those things are there, and they're important, um, but it's impossible to explore them. I mean, these people talk and they write and they're fascinating to talk to, and I hope you can come and, and talk to Chung Bin tomorrow about what he's doing and, and why. But there is psychological and there's personal content, and there's explorations of issues other than just straight artistic issues, environmental issues here. Um, in Li Huayi's landscapes, women's, women's issues and Peng Wei's paintings, um, different kinds of, uh, Muxian, of course, was really, I mean, psychologically, he had a very difficult time during the Cultural Revolution, as any number of these artists did, so they, they, they're reacting to that as well. So it was just something I didn't think I had time, and I actually went over anyway, so <laughs> I didn't have time to deal with in today's talk. Other, question, other questions? Yes. How much time do I have? <laughs> okay, let me, that's, that's not, I've written about that, and it's something I've been working on, because the market is important. Uh, and that's, you know, there, were, there was a time not so long ago when art history was talking about a lot, art historians were talking a lot about patronage and the impact on patronage on the arts that were created. And that hasn't happened with these artists yet. Um, but it, there's a reason to talk about it now because the auction houses are getting into this. A lot of the market is getting into this. So the Western, Christie's and Sotheby's are now doing these, um, these contemporary literati, which is an impossible concept. Um, they're doing these shows and selling ink paintings, at, and some of these ink paintings would be millions of dollars, uh, these living artists. So the market's important, and they're kind of, all kinds of ways to look at the market. The market can be a negative thing because it forces, you know, it, you have to respond to the market. The market can be a liberating thing. If you're an artist and you've come to a, a, a personal kind of expression that is successful on the market, suddenly you're no longer waiting tables. You're making art for a living. Uh, so the market becomes very important. And the shift of the market from pretty much artists painting for themselves or for their colleagues or working at institutions in China to artists who are working in a, a freer market environment. That's an important step. That's an important step for the artists. It's also an important step for China as a, as a culture, as it emerges from that terrible dark period of the Cultural Revolution and moves forward. So the fact that there is now a strong market in China for ink painting doesn't only speak to the artists. It also speaks to China. Uh, so the market's important, and it's an important exploration to take on. I just don't have, I mean, it, it would be fun. I would be glad to talk about it at some point, but now today it's complicated and it's wonderful. <laughs> Does that kind of give you an idea? Yeah, the market is very important. I think the market's very important anyway. And dealers play an important role. Um, it's a point that Li Huayi may never have become what he is if Kaikudo, the gallery in New York, hadn't discovered him. Uh, and started marketing his work. Uh, and that's true for a number of these artists. Liu Dan was starving. And a person that I work with in San Francisco basically supported him for, for a year, uh, just buying his works. And then he was discovered by a gallery. And suddenly, he was a great. Now, even my, my, uh, the collector that I work with um, flies his private jet to Beijing and says, these guys live like kings. So these guys are doing well. Uh, so the market's important. Uh, and it, gives, it can give freedom, but can also give restrictions. 
If somebody wants a Li Huayi, they want a Li Huayi. They don't want something that Li Huayi is doing now because he's tired of doing that and wants to do something else. They want what he's been doing. They want what they've seen. So there's a good side and a bad side to the market, but it's an interesting one to explore. There are a lot of issues there. Other questions? Yes. Would you say something about your own personal art collection, asking what you enjoy on the wall that you're living Donald could probably talk to that as well as I can. Uh, when, I signed, uh, when I signed on at the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco, I signed an agreement. I was an employee of the city of, uh, and county of San Francisco, and I signed an agreement that I would not collect in my area of expertise. I have no Chinese art. I'm not allowed to collect Chinese. I was not allowed by contract to collect Chinese art. So um, I love furniture. I have studied Chinese joinery. I make furniture. Uh, I have lots of furniture that has Chinese joinery in it, but I made it. Um, I like arts and crafts stuff, but I don't have Chinese stuff. I'm not allowed to collect in the area. I can now, but I'm just starting a business, so I'm a little bit tentative about spending lots of money on something like that. I'd love to have one of those. I'd love to have one of those. I know exactly how much that painting costs. I'm not going to get one. <laughs> This piece is at Eskenazi's. It'll be on display at Eskenazi's in London uh, in November. I'm not going to tell you the price. I'm afraid that's confidential. But you can check these catalog when, when it comes out. It's a lot. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Can you compare uh, Japanese uh, to Chinese calligraphy? I'm going to, yes and yeah, no. <laughs> I want, I want, okay, I, I, this is a question I want to kind of walk, wander around a little bit, but I want to take you to a, a time in, in Japan in the seventh century. I'm answering your question, but I'm answering it indirectly. In the seventh century, there was a global culture. That was China, that was the China of the Tang Dynasty. Um, and it was spreading throughout East Asia. Uh, as Mary Beth and I were talking about this yesterday, in Japan, the, the, the newest movement in certain kinds of areas was what was most recently off the boat, whether it was Chinese art via Korea or Chinese art via China. A lot about what was going on in Japan was about what was going on in China. At the same time, the Japanese began to recognize that they were Japanese. They had an other to compare themselves to. And they began to develop a sense of who Japan would be and how it differed from China. And that has been true from the seventh century until today. The fact that they're doing the same characters has very little to do with the cultural context and the way the art is used and the, the whole philosophy behind them. So Chinese characters and Japanese characters may on the surface look the same, but the traditions are very, very different. Japanese calligraphy is Japanese calligraphy. Chinese calligraphy is Chinese calligraphy. The ways of judging them, the ways of talking about them, the ways they were used, the reasons why they were created, they're all very, very different. The idea that China, that Japan is a derivative culture from China is, is a fallacy. Japan is a floor-based culture. They look at their art in a different perspective. Um, the whole, the languages are different. Everything is different. So. They're different traditions. A Chinese person looking at Japanese calligraphy may not like it. A Japanese calligrapher looking at Chinese calligraphy may not like it. Uh, that doesn't make either one of them more valid than the other. They're just very, very different. And the cultural perspective and the ways of creation, the ways of usage are very, very different. Does that kind of answer your, kind of roundabout get to your question? They're very different. Other, other, other questions that I can answer?